Okay, this video is called Who Did What in Nutrition? And the purpose is just so to give a quick summary of the big landmark research in nutrition or persons who sort of change the direction of thinking and research in nutrition. So this is a quick summary for somebody who wants the history of nutrition very fast. Here it is. Okay, Walter Kempner, MD, in the 1940s and 50s, he was described by Dr. McDougall as the best doctor who ever lived. The guy was an incredible genius. He started out with his training in internal medicine, also doing research on preventing kidney failure. And he worked with Otto Warburg in Germany, who you know won the Nobel Prize in 1931 for discovering the Warburg effect. So anyways, he had a patient, you know, it was a fat black lady who he couldn't talk to her real quick, and he told her, just eat only rice for the next two weeks and then come back and see me at my office, okay? She came back two months later. She lost an incredible amount of weight. It was really healthy. It was a very big surprise, and then he studied the Asians, you know, how skinny and healthy they were eating the rice diet, and he figured that might work on American patients. He ended up putting about over 19,000 patients on the rice diet, and he did an incredible job of reversing hypertension and kidney failure. There was no dialysis back in those days, so either the diet worked or they died. Okay, the rice is only 1% in fat calories, and it's about 7 or 8%, depending on what you read. Some people have said as low as 5%, other people say as high as 8%. Let's just call it 7% of calories from protein, but that's still quite a low amount of protein and an extraordinarily low amount of fat plus he had he did a lot of things he would rinse it several times to get all the salt off it and he had him on a very low salt diet to prevent hypertension so anyways he had incredible results you can read the best biography of him is by Newborg who was a lady doctor who worked with him it's a very good book I've read it like three times um, his other books that he wrote about his research are available at drmcdougall.com so you could read them they're rather extraordinary um, Okay, the next one is Dennis Burkett, the fiber man, the Irish Christian missionary to Africa. He first described the pattern of a disease, you know, a big tumor of the jaw, for example, and it was called Burkett's lymphoma. There was excitement at that time to try to link it to causation by a virus. Um, he also then became put in charge of all the epidemiology of Africa, you know, many, many, like over a thousand hospitals. And he put together, you know, along with the work of some co-workers, but he put together what is now called abdominal pressure syndrome, whereby fiber adds water to the stool, making your poop like a cow patty instead of like a Tootsie Roll. And when you have, when a person's constipated from eating a meat and processed food diet, they get back pressure, causing diverticulosis, diverticulitis of the sigmoid colon, as well as increased appendicitis, increased abdominal hernias, increased inguinal hernias, increased hiatal hernia stomach going up into the chest with gastroesophageal reflux, reflux, GERD. Okay, so we figured all that stuff out. And also constipation can make you infertile, causing increased pressure on the veins in the scrotum. A varicocele heats up the testicle, uh, less able to make sperm. So that was an incredibly helpful achievement. And also colon cancer goes up, of course, with decreased fiber. Next was Nathan Pritikin. Nathan Pritikin himself suffered a health scare with uh, severe coronary artery disease when he was relatively young. I think in his 30s, um, late 30s, something like that. He then tried to reverse his own heart disease. The guy was a genius. He had patented several inventions, was quite wealthy, so he had money and time and a brilliant mind, and he studied all the nutrition literature, and he figured out basically fat is bad. That's a profound statement because a lot of people are tricked by this modern slogan of good fats, and he went through everything you could study that was known about fat in the world at that time. And he also found research papers showing that people could live quite healthy on less than 1% of their dietary calories from fat. And that's because you got some omega-3s and omega-6s in your plant foods. And then the thing that people don't know about is your fiber is partially converted to fat. The good gut bacteria convert dietary fiber and part of it into short-chain fatty acids. A lot of that is butyrate used to maintain the colon lining cells, epithelial cells, and pterocyte cells and to make tight junctions to prevent leaky gut or increase intestinal permeability. But the rest of it, the acetate, two carbons, an even number of carbons, and the propionate, three carbons, an odd number of carbons, they just go up to the liver through, from the gut through the portal vein to the liver, and the liver makes them into whatever fats the body needs or sends them out so the cells can do that task. And so the point is, don't worry about fat. We get plenty of fat. All right, It's a non-issue. Right? <clears throat> uh, Dr. McDougall uh, did a lot of great things for the nutrition world. He's the world expert on the nutrition literature of the 1900s, 
and he sort of kept alive a lot of the work of Walter Kempner. It would almost be lost to mankind. Like I said, he put uh, Kempner's books available at his, um, at his website, drmcdougall.com. He's cataloged great outcomes <clears throat> over decades and decades for dietary treatment with low-fat vegan diet of diabetes, hypertension, coronary artery disease, autoimmune disease, and cancer. Plus, McDougal cuts through the BS. There's a lot of nutrition experts out there who, in my opinion, they sort of BS the public with unrealistic advice. They say, oh, you should minimize your intake of meat, minimize your intake of oil. That does not work with regular people. Regular people cannot handle that. I see really bad outcomes, and, and I've seen a bunch of deaths from people who have this, well, I'm cutting down on my meat, I'm cutting down on my oil. Meanwhile, they're just deteriorating, going down the tubes, and then they have a fatal myocardial infarction, stroke, or kidney failure. No, McDougal tells you the truth. Meat and oils are a metabolic poison, and you should never eat them again. Like you tell an alcoholic, not one sip of alcohol ever again. You don't tell an alcoholic you can drink on the weekends. You don't tell a cigarette smoker you can smoke on the weekends. You tell them never again. That's important to do. That's like biblical thinking. Thou shalt not eat meat. Thou shalt not eat oils. And people say, well, why are you so harsh? Why are you so extreme? Because that's what works, okay? You don't get it. These people are screwed. They're demented. They're dead. I mean, it's it's sad. I see one disaster after another all day long with conventional medicine and, and people still eating the sad diet and the meat diet and stuff. Basically, if you want to, you know, get sick and die, keep on eating meat and oils. Okay, what else? So I like the way that he kept history alive. And I say that reminds me of Aeneas carrying his father Anchises out of burning Troy. You know, you keep alive the valuable knowledge from the past. And he had a lot of guts, you know. He spoke up at a time when dairy was, like, considered one of the best foods about all the problems with dairy. And also, after Ansel Keys had figured out that sat fat was quite bad for our health back in the 1950s, then they tried to popularize the omega-6 cooking oils. And uh, McDougall did a good job, along with uh, Nathan Pritikin, about showing how disastrous they are for health. And there were other people who did some good research study on that, um, like Ray Rosenman, Meyer Friedman, um, Okay, let's see, what else? Um, Otto Warburg. Otto Warburg, we're now going to go a little bit. Also, another great thing that McDougal did is, and why do I like some McDougal so much? Okay, I'll tell you why. Because McDougal uses brain, okay? He figured out, look, all the healthy populations eat starch. He looked at the epidemiology. That's what makes them healthy. That's what we're designed to eat. And some people say, well, I only want to go by the proven research. I got news for you. Most things that are useful never get any significant amount of research. Most things that empower the public are relatively free for the public, and therefore they never get funded. So there's never going to be all the research that you want to be. You have to use your brain and come up, you know, through you know deductive reasoning, inductive reasoning, come up with a reasonable system, okay? And then you try to look at the epidemiology. Does it? Does something close to that work in real life? That's what you have to do. And McDougall's rationale of eat starch and you'll be skinny and you'll dramatically avoid your risk of all these diseases. You know, that's valuable information. I would say, you know, I'm board certified in three fields, 99% on my boards, med school and residency. The most valuable thing I ever learned in my entire pre-med through adult education all these years, over 40 years, is that humans are designed to eat starch. That's the most valuable thing you could know. Because uh, it fixes almost all the other problems. It's like saying, what is the most valuable personal characteristic of a person? And it's probably courage. Courage and love, okay? Because courage makes people have the be willing to do the right thing and love makes them want to do the right thing, okay? Um, let's see. Otto Warburg, you know, he figured out that if you make tissue hypoxic, decrease the oxygen to tissue, you'll induce cancer. And we talked about that because it causes mitochondrial failure and the cell transforms itself into being like an anaerobic bacteria. It's almost like this primitive biologic pathway that's reactivated um, in the absence of oxygen because the initial formation of the world was without oxygen, okay? That's incredibly useful stuff, and that's the foundation of the metabolic theory of cancer. And once you learn about the metabolic theory of cancer, then you can see what the modern paradigm of the somatic mutation theory, you know, saying cancers are genetic and are caused by chemicals that cause mutations, is mostly nonsense, okay? The metabolic theory of cancer tells you exactly what to do, and I've seen much better results with that approach to cancer than with the somatic mutation theory BS. Okay, there is some examples of somatic mutation theory being accurate and useful, but what I'm trying to say is it's a minor thing compared to metabolic theory of cancer. And if you want to have a hope of a, of a better outcome with, a, with the common cancers, it's extremely useful. It's the most valuable thing you could do is start studying that metabolic theory of cancer. Okay, T. Colin Campbell. I joke that he looks like Mr. Turtle, but the guy, you know, he deserves a Nobel Prize. Um, 
he figured out that animal protein was the number one carcinogen. And what was so incredible about his discovery was, you know, all the guts he had through the decades long of, you know, him being ostracized because he basically had gone against the, you know, the American old fashioned value of animal protein was the best thing. Okay. And when, and he grew up on like a cattle farm. So to go against his entire upbringing and his scientific education and the entire <laughs> established nutritional industry, both in education and in providing food, uh, took a lot of bravery and brains, and he did it. Okay, his book, China Studies, is one of the all-time best nutrition books ever written. Okay, David Sabatini and others. So they, he did a lot of the great work on mTOR, mammalian target of rapamycin, also called mechanistic target of rapamycin. And it's basically a nutrient-sensing pathway to determine when a cell is ready to grow and replicate, to make a copy of itself. And he showed that leucine from animal protein is a major activator. Animal protein has a lot more leucine than does plant protein. It also has more methionine, okay? And, and the point being is things that activate mTOR speed up cell replication. Um, and that's a big deal because they accelerate aging. They accelerate the rate at which you reach what's called the Hayflick limit. Normally cells in the body can only divide about 60 times, other than stem cells and germ cells. So stem cells are cells that have to repeat, divide. Uh, germ cells are your, your gonads, okay? So other than that... A cell typically can only divide about 60 times. Hayflick was a scientist who worked with human tissue cultures, and he discovered that. That's why it's called the Hayflick limit. And it's because the telomeres shorten with each cell division. And eventually you start shortening your chromosomes into um, genes that you need to have the cell to survive. Okay, so anyways, so this is very valuable information, all right, because he gave another reason why meat causes cancer. Meat is high in leucine. It's excess sat fat causes insulin resistance so insulin levels go up and it tends to be high in iron especially like red meat the beef okay so um that's going to activate mTOR in a big way and as colin campbell said meat's the number one animal uh, car is the number one carcinogen in the world okay all right dean ornish he did a couple of landmark studies in several different areas he showed that a vegetarian diet can halt the progression of coronary artery disease back using spec scans okay um and that was like a randomized control study and provided you know, incredible uh, motivation and support for the idea of dietary treatment for coronary artery disease, which is the number one cause of death. He also did a landmark study in progression of low-grade prostate cancer being halted by a vegetarian diet. Um, men were able to keep their PSAs uh, unchanged or decreasing, so they didn't have to go on to more aggressive therapies like radiation or surgery. Okay, he also did another study showing that telomere shortening can be slowed down by healthy living habits and diet. Okay, um... Ruth Heydrich, Ph.D., Lorraine Day, uh, Janet Murray Wakelin, they all had uh, metastatic breast cancer, and they survived for multiple decades going low-fat vegan, okay? Uh, Ruth, in particular, ran tons of triathlons and marathons. Uh, Janet Murray, she did a whole bunch of triathlons. She actually ran a, tri a, a marathon. She didn't do a triathlon. She ran a marathon every single day of the year and ran around the entire outer perimeter of Australia. They all wrote books about their experience. Their books are good. I, I've read all these books. Okay. Um, Don Yomianis and Dean Murphy, they did, you know, pioneering research work and, and popularization of uh, how F- minus causes lowered IQ, increased cancer risk, and it also causes skeletal fluorosis by damaging collagen. So in a, in a sense, too, these molecules can cause autoimmune disease because when a protein is damaged by binding with F minus, it distorts its shape, and the distortion of its shape can cause it to become a damps, a damps or a pamps, if you will. A damps means damage associated molecular pattern. Okay, and so what that means is when the F minus binds to the protein and distorts its shape, it now is no longer recognized as normal by the immune system, and the immune system will then sort of attack it, if you will, to try to remove it from the body. So that's a big deal because it has a tendency to damage collagen, which is about a third of the proteins in our body. And you need that in particular for, amongst other things, for spine stability. So excess F minus, like a person who drinks tap water with this stuff all their life, they're at increased risk to damage their spine, the collagen in their spine. And that leads to skeletal fluorosis, which is very much like this, diffuse idiopathic skeletal hyperostosis, which is primarily caused by ischemia. But F minus is a significant contributor. That's highly relevant because I see this all day long, and it causes people a lot of pain and suffering and loss of mobility and strength. Okay, Michael Brownlee, MD, he wrote the paper. It's the best paper ever written on diabetes. It's a genius paper. 
It's like I almost wanted to cry when I read this paper. It was so beautiful. It was intellectually, aesthetically beautiful. It's called Unifying Theory of Diabetes Complications. And it shows how fat, especially sat fat, but fat in general reverses electron transport. And then that leads to a whole cascade of events that we know as diabetes, including ins insulin resistance and increased insulin levels in the blood because of the insulin resistance. Okay, you can get that paper for free. You can download that paper for free. If you want to see a work of, uh, you know, like the Sistine Chapel is to painting, this paper is to diabetes research. Okay, uh, Gerald Sheldman, MD, PhD, working out at Yale. He used nuclear magnetic resonance spectroscopy to show that fat and skeletal muscle is the first detectable finding of insulin resistance, okay? So this guy is a great genius. His lecture is available for free. You just go to YouTube. You can watch Gerald. They both, he won the Banting Award in 2018. Uh, for his research on diabetes as the best diabetes researcher in the world. And you can watch his lecture. It's great. Uh, Brownlee's lecture, you can watch the video of it, but you have to sign in to the ADA, American Diabetic Association site, in order to watch, the, to watch him lecture about it. Okay, and by the way, when he first starts out, you're going to think he's talking about carbohydrate. But if you understand what he's saying, he's talking about carbohydrate indirectly and fat directly. Okay. That'll, you'll, you'll get that if you, if you actually pursue studying that any further. Caldwell Esselstyn, of course. I joke, I call him the giant grasshopper because he's so tall and his arms are so long and his legs and he's got the big thick glasses. Um, he deserves to win a Nobel Prize too. He wrote the book Prevent and Reverse Heart Disease. He sort of took the study of coronary artery disease prevention to a higher level. Bigger studies, longer duration. Um, he had 167 patients in a row, went low-fat vegan and no recurrent coronary events. Um, in four years who had previously had coronary problems. Okay, that's incredible. There's nothing even in that ballpark. The closest thing is a so-called, you know, Lyon study, Lyon study, where they use an optimized version of the Mediterranean diet, and he still had like about 32 times better results. Um, and regular people don't eat the optimized Mediterranean diet. They eat a crafty version of the Mediterranean diet. I think the Mediterranean diet's a big joke, tricks people, makes them unhealthy. Okay, Gregory Sloop, MD. By the way, this, this talk's going to be just two slides. So this is the first one, and then there'll be one other one. Okay, Gregory Sloop, uh, he looks like a giant grasshopper too, you know, big tall guy with big glasses. Uh, this guy's a genius. He's the guy who really figured out atherothrombosis theory. There's always other persons who contributed to the theory. There's other persons who did good work contributing to atherothrombosis theory, but he put it all together. And he wrote a book about, you know, cardiovascular uh, disease and hemorrheology. Um, it's a great book. The, the guy is just a genius. Okay, so it's the best explanation of atherosclerosis and hemorrheology. I did a fellowship in interventional radiology with the emphasis, imaging guided surgery with the emphasis on vascular disease. I've been studying atherosclerosis in some detail for, you know, about 20, 30 years, okay? And I can tell you, atherothrombosis theory puts it all together. I look at thousands of arteriograms and atherothrombosis theory it fits everything. Everything fits. And people say, well, what about cholesterol? Yeah, cholesterol is important. It's a subset of atherothrombosis theory. The reason why cholesterol is important is LDL cholesterol is a bridging molecule, meaning that it has a positive charge on it, and it'll stick red blood cells together. Red blood cells have what's called a zeta potential along their outer surface, a negative charge from the sialic acids and the cholesterol sulfates, for example. And that makes them repel each other, the negative charges. So you need a positive charge that's big enough that can stick the RBCs together, and LDL cholesterol does that. That's why it's the number one risk factor for atherosclerosis. But the atherosclerosis plaque itself, it begins as a blood clot, okay? That's a really important point. That's why a kid, you know, a teenager with sickle cell anemia can have a myocardial infarction, because it's a blood clot, okay? Um, what else? William Roberts, MD, cardiac pathologist, great cardiac pathologist. Oh, by the way, Gregory Sloop is a pathologist as well by training, and I think that's funny because... Everybody, when they start out in medicine, myself included, thinks that, oh, gee, cardiologists and vascular surgeons and vascular interventional radiologists, they know atherosclerosis better than anyone because they work with it every day. That's actually not true. The reason is they, are, they think like plumbers. Here is a blockage. How can I stent open the blockage? Or should I recommend a surgical bypass of the blockage? Okay? That's how a plumber thinks. That's not the way to think. The correct way to think is like a philosopher. Why? does atherosclerosis occur? Why do these risk factors cause atherosclerosis? What prevents it? Okay, anyways, the reason I'm getting into all that is because the pathologists, they just look at atherosclerosis under a microscope. They don't care what the treatment is. What I mean by that is, if you're a cardiologist, you have to stay, say stents are good. If you don't say stents are good, 
you'll be run out of the profession because they make tons of money from stents, all right? If you're a surgeon, vascular surgeon, cardiovascular surgeon, you have to say that surgery is good or you'll be run out of the profession because that's how they make their money. All right, so whereas a pathologist, he doesn't care if you treat it with a diet, a medicine, a stent, or a surgery. He just wants to understand what it is. And so once I started reading their literature, everything made sense. And, um, and then I, I look at CT angiograms every day and MR angiograms, and I've seen many thousands of catheter angiograms. I've done many hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. So I can tell you this, everything that Sloop and Robert says, that, that matches my experience exactly, and it's correct. So when I look at a, a CT angiogram, atherosclerosis looks the same as a blood clot because it is a blood clot, okay? It looks the same as a resolving hematoma. Okay, Chef AJ, the mother of the vegan community. She figured out the best approach for weight loss and summarized it in her books, uh, Secrets of Ultimate Weight Loss and Unprocessed. Okay, um, this is the last slide here. Anthony J, PhD, lipid biochemist. He wrote the best book ever written on estrogen chemistry called Estrogeneration, which is very valuable information because all these women dying of breast cancer, you know, and our family members and friends who get breast cancer, you know, they run around with a pink ribbon, we're raising money for breast cancer. All you're doing is giving money to the chemo company, okay? It's a big joke, and, you know, I know you mean well, but you're kind of stupid. The smart thing to do is learn about estrogen chemistry. That's how you prevent breast cancer, by learning about estrogen chemistry. And he does a, he does a magnificent job of summarizing. This is one of the all-time best health books written. I made a video, you know, top 25 health books ever written. This is one of them. It's an extraordinary book. It's funny. It's clever. It's concise. It's brilliant. Okay. And he also tells the truth about all the problems with soy. You know, most of these modern people are kind of a bunch of fake, lightweight, phonies and liars. Um, you know, all these people promoting soy. It's a disgrace. They, you know... Read the papers, okay, and learn for yourself, okay? That, to me, that's one of the litmus tests of somebody who knows what they're talking about and actually reads and studies versus somebody who's BSing you. Okay, I know some modern papers have come out saying soy is the greatest thing. Yeah, right. Who do you think's funding those papers? Okay, Philippa Darbra, PhD. She did a lot of the great research on figuring things out, like deodorant causes breast cancer in the upper outer quadrant of the breast. She wrote a nice textbook on estrogen chemistry. The difference is... His book is clever, fun, short, concise. Okay, I've read like five books on estrogen chemistry. Her book is a textbook, and it's a little bit boring in comparison and formal. It's like something to educate PhD students or, you know, chem majors in college on the chemistry of estrogen. But, you know, it's still a good book, and she did awesome research. Okay, Douglas Kell, PhD, Etheresia, Pretorius. I spelled her name wrong, Etheresia. It's almost like ether for anesthesia. Okay, Pretorius. Okay, they did really kind of awesome genius work on showing connections between leaky gut, increased intestinal permeability, dormant bacteria getting into the blood because of leaky gut, and then going dormant because there is a shortage of iron, the way the body sequesters iron to prevent bacteria from proliferating. And then how iron overload that occurs with increased age, you know, in men it starts in the 20s, and women when they're postmenopausal, leading to progressive amounts of oxidative stress, and how this can lead to uh, increased iron availability due to aging and iron overload can lead to reactivation of dormant bacteria with subsequent bacterial release of endotoxins causing the blood to clot. And that's called amyloidogenic blood clotting. It, it, it's a chemical term whereby the protein, the clotting proteins aren't just clotting in their usual way. They're becoming more um, amyloidogenic, which means more into polymers. They're switching from alpha helix configuration to a beta pleated sheet. Alpha helix means cylindrical, which doesn't stick together that well and can easily be lysed to amyloidogenic, meaning beta pleated sheet, flat sheets of paper that stack upon each other, and they stack up into big piles, and they're very hard to, to remove, okay? And how this can lead to beta amyloid precipitation and dementia. Okay, I know that's a lot of fancy stuff. The bottom line is, they wrote an awesome paper showing called Iron Behaving Badly. So they did a great job of showing how iron causes so many problems, because people think iron is a good thing. Iron is a very dangerous thing, okay? And uh, iron overload is much, 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 much more common than iron deficiency anemia, all right? They used to call iron deficiency anemia the virgin's disease because it was most common in young, young girls when they hit their teenage puberty years because they're simultaneously rapidly growing, increasing the demand for iron while they first begin to menstruate, losing bodily iron, okay? All right, Albert Espe. Uh, what I really like about this guy, he's a, he's a researcher, especially specializing in Parkinson's disease, but... He wrote a great book called Brain Fables, where he talks about how much bogus nonsense there is in the research paradigms for Alzheimer's dementia and Parkinson's disease. And the, one of the reasons why I think this book is so beneficial and I included it in here is because 
There's been billions of dollars spent doing bogus research on Alzheimer's just trying to come up with a pill, you know, to treat the so-called beta amyloid theory, which is bogus. And he may, he sort of pointed out, look at Alzheimer's, what a joke it is. You can't diagnose it by historical finding, asking the patient a question or their family. You can't diagnose it by physical exam. There's no good blood test to diagnose it. The imaging tests are not that reliable. And you can't even reliably diagnose it at autopsy because so many normal people have so much um, of these same plaques in their head. So the point I'm saying is if you can't diagnose a disease and you can't treat it, isn't that kind of a joke? Okay, and the point is, <clears throat> if you want to make sense out of dementia, you need to look elsewhere. And we're going to do that in a moment when I give you these other researchers. Um, <clears throat> and it, this is one of the big things. To do good research, you have to have reasonable theories to work with. And what happens is the big money takes over and it pushes a bogus theory because you can make money off. And it reminds me of pushing the SMT, somatic mutation theory for cancer, because that's where all the money, research money goes, even though the metabolic theory of cancer is so much more accurate and useful. Okay, so these theories are a really important big deal because they determine what you do, all right? Metabolic theory of cancer shows you how you can help yourself by stress management, by changing your diet and all that and your lifestyle. Okay, Roy Swank, MD, he's a guy, Mr. Sat Fat is bad. He's the one who figured out that dairy causes multiple sclerosis. He was looking at the epidemiology in Norway, you know, in the center of the country where they had the dairy farms, tons of MS, bad MS, in the periphery where they didn't have the dairy farms, much, much lower MS and milder MS. And then he took, you know, many patients and he put them on a low-fat diet, largely plant-based. But the key thing was avoiding saturated fat from his point of view. And he had, like, the best results in the world ever of anybody for the treatment of diabetes. He even had patients he followed up for, like, over 40 years, and they still had awesome results. Most of them, the vast majority of them, had intact ADLs, activities of daily living. It was rather incredible. And he also made these beautiful videos on blood sludge, showing how after eating a fat meal, the red blood cells all sludge together, and that drops oxygen delivery to the tissues, which, of course, can cause um, ischemia, can cause uh, cancer potentially in some locations, can cause um, dysfunction of brain cells. And um, then you got to get into all the leaky gut stuff or the multiple sclerosis mechanisms. He talked about vascular injury to the brain, increasing blood-brain barrier permeability, and they didn't know all this stuff back then, but you simultaneously get increased leaky gut and, and increased blood-brain barrier permeability, making the brain more vulnerable to any toxins that are in the blood. And I actually think a big part of it is that, you know, the dairy proteins have similar structure to the myelin protein in the brain, and it'll cause autoantibody cross-reactivity in the context of leaky gut. Okay, so anyways... Awesome work by Swank, and Dr. McDougall did a lot to help to popularize his work. Swank wrote a good book. If you're interested in that, I recommend you see the videos of him that are available at Dr. McDougall's uh, channel, YouTube channel, okay? Uh, Tetsumori Yamashima, MD, he's a Japanese scientist who figured out why is dementia becoming so much more common in Japan. And the main part of his theory was the omega-6 cooking oils undergo lipid peroxidation. So they're a poof of polyunsaturated fatty acid. The more double bonds you have in a fatty acid, the more predisposed it is to undergo lipid peroxidation, um, which is a type of oxidation that destroys the molecule. And they form toxic aldehydes like HNE, hydroxynonanol, and that causes uh, loss of brain cells, loss of neurons, and dementia. It also causes damage to the hunger center in the pituitary uh, region, hypothalamus, arcuate nucleus, and um, uh, hypothalamus, really. And that also leads to decreased ability to control one's diet, so it increases the risk of uh, obesity. Okay, it also damages the pancreatic beta cells and <laughs> increases the risk of diabetes. So it's bad, all right? Okay, uh, this guy, Christopher Exley, he's known as Mr. Aluminum. He showed, uh, he wrote a book all about this, how aluminum is a major brain toxin, Okay. It's good to know. Okay, and, and, and then also I kind of joke a little bit about, you know, Dr. McDougall talking about how aluminum is so important and he believes it's the main cause of Alzheimer's. And it certainly is a major neurotoxin, but I kind of joke and tease that, you know, there's a lot of other things that do it, lots of them. Okay, we'll talk about that some other time, some other lecture. Okay, Jack Delatorre, PhD. This guy did awesome research on the cause of dementia. He's the one who was tying off the carotid artery in the mouse. That's the main artery that supplies the brain with blood. And he showed that middle-aged and older mice had become demented about two months later from that. And then I call this the mouse equivalent theory because there's a whole bunch of things that will cause chronic cerebral hypoperfusion, meaning a decrease in blood flow to the brain. And that's highly relevant because 
I think the most common cause of dementia is overtreated hypertension, dropping blood supply to the brain, and then you start gradually losing brain cells to apoptosis. And I say that because I looked at thousands of demented brains, and the most common thing I see is just a shrunken atrophic brain. And so that means atrophy. Atrophy is something that shrinks from a lack of use. But what I'm getting at is people used to think all this beta amyloid stuff with Alzheimer's, and people would also think, oh, it's due to having a stroke. No, a lot of the brains I see are clean, clean in the sense they have very few, if any, strokes, but they're shrunken. And so apoptosis is when chronic lack of blood supply is the main reason, but there's, there's other things too. I'm going to get into that in a moment. But the brain cells just die. They go into apoptosis. So apoptosis is gradual, slow cell death or programmed cell death, whereby the cells, organelles, and chemical constituents are recycled. Okay, so you don't see anything when you look at a brain MRI if apoptosis is the cause of cell loss other than a shrunken brain, atrophy. Um, versus necrosis is when you have a sudden, a complete occlusion of the big artery and there's no blood supply to, to brain tissue and it just dies real fast. That's called necrosis. The plasma membrane lysis and all the internal contents spill out and the immune system does a big cleanup job. And so that is... Nothing can be recycled in the context of necrosis, okay? But you can see that. You can point your finger to it on a brain MRI. This is where the stroke happened, okay? Okay, this next group of researchers, Peter Gochke, Grace Jackson, Robert Whitaker, Peter Bragan, and Kelly Brogan, all of them did research on psychiatric drugs. Well, first of all, I'll just mention Gochke also did a lot of research. He was like the best researcher in the world with the Cochrane collaboration, and he showed what a joke mammography was, okay, which is a, a motivator. Once you see what a joke mammography was, you'll be more motivated to learn about estrogenic chemistry. Okay, but getting back to all of them, they all showed that psychiatric drugs are mostly a joke. Most of them are basically brain toxins, okay. In the short term, there might be settings where they're valuable, like let's say you have a schizophrenic who's psychotic and out of control. To sedate them could be useful short term, uh, but long term, most of these drugs are quite harmful to the brain. Um, and the reason why I mention this in the context of nutrition is all this research on the effects of nutrition on the brain are mostly neglected. You know, I give in lectures before about food and mood. I give a whole bunch of lectures on that. And I also gave lectures on mitochondria inhibitors. These food dyes, many of them are mitochondrial electron transport inhibitors. That's going to cause brain dysfunction. You also have, you know, the antifungal preservatives in these foods. Well, guess what? Those are mitochondrial electron transport inhibitors too. <laughs> That's bad. The brain needs tons and tons of energy. So if you're inhibiting the ability of the mitochondria to make ATP, you are screwing up the brain. Okay. And then on top of that, a lot of these foods have stimulants in them. And I say stimulants, I mean things like caffeine, for example, that increases glutamate transmitter, um, the excitatory neurotransmitter in the hippocampus. So you could be worried about that worsening anxiety from caffeine, from the sweetener aspartame, from the food uh, enhancer called MSG. <laughs> Not good. Glyphosate is also an excitotoxin. The glycine in it of glycine phosphate, it binds the NMDA receptor for, for glutamate and increases its activation. So that's also an excitotoxin. All bad, okay? Um, anyways, all of them did uh, great work in, the, in that area. They all wrote books about it as well. Okay, Richard Moore, MD, PhD, he wrote an awesome book. The guy dedicated his whole life to doing research on plasma membrane ion pumps and understanding hypertension. And his book is the best thing ever written by far on the subject of hypertension. It's called The High Blood Pressure Solution by Richard Moore. Um, and he showed how <clears throat> excessive dietary sodium causes disruption of plasma membrane electrochemical gradients, meaning electro meaning the, the, the charge gradient and chemical meaning the concentration gradient of sodium inside versus outside the cell. And when you disrupt that gradient, it leads to an accumulation of calcium in the cytoplasm. Calcium in the cytoplasm of an arterial vascular smooth muscle cell will cause contraction, and that causes thus narrowing of the artery. And when the heart has to pump through a narrowed uh, vascular system, pressure goes up, hypertension. Okay, and then that has all the secondary effects of the hypertension itself, subsequently damaging vessels, including the blood vessels in the brain. By the way, all of these names are highlighted in yellow because this is all related to the brain, you know, neuro... Okay, so anyways, um, that's why I did that. Russell Blalick, uh, he popularized the concept of excitotoxicity. His father died of Parkinson's disease, and he felt it was due to excitotoxicity effects, and he wrote a landmark book on that subject, and he also showed how that relates to dementia and neuron loss, and he explained the research of earlier researchers like Olney on MSG, and he also talked about research on aspartame 
And that kind of got me thinking about all this stuff. Plus, I read another interesting book by Lady Brindy Brody and the Calcium Connection. And it got me to reading all about, um, I'll talk about that in a moment, all about the, what's going on as far as excitotoxicity and calcium metabolism in the brain. Okay, Stephanie Seneff, PhD, she figured out that glyphosate, you know, spread on the non-organic food damages collagen, which is what I'm getting at why it can cause spine problems. She also figured out that it's in a brain excitotoxin, and it causes a whole a lot of other problems, okay? She believed it's a major contributor to causation for autism, for fatty liver, and for other things as well, and for autoimmune disease. Very fascinating book. Okay, her book is that kind of awesome. The only thing is she should have put pictures in it because it's really complicated. I mean, I read biochemistry books all the time, so I'm pretty comfortable with it. But it could have been a lot easier if she had put more uh, pictures in it. She does have a lot of slideshow lectures on the Internet. Okay, the book's called Toxic Legacy. All right, uh, now here's me, the Spartan vegan, Peter Rogers, MD. I figured out that neurovascular uncoupling is a major cause of neuronal death, okay? Pretty obvious that you have a certain metabolic activity rate for a neuron, and then you have a certain amount of oxygen and glucose delivery. And those are normally coupled to each other. The amount of oxygen and glucose delivery is matched to the activity of the neuron, and it has to be that way so the neuron can get the energy it needs when it has to ramp up its activity. But the problem is, look at caffeine. Caffeine is a vasoconstrictor, lowering oxygen and glucose delivery to the brain cell, while simultaneously being an excitotoxin, meaning that it increases glutamate trans transmission across that synapse, so it causes increased activation in the postsynaptic neuron. So what that means is it's dropping oxygen and glucose delivery while simultaneously increasing activity rate. Not good. Okay, and then you start throwing everything else in there. A high-fat meal, that's going to cause tissue hypoxia, decrease oxygen and glucose delivery. Throw in some sodium like you're eating a pizza, that's going to cause a vasoconstriction, decrease oxygen and glucose delivery. Then there's going to be an MSG flavoring on there, monosodium glutamate, increasing glutamate, increasing neuronal activity. You're going to get more and more uncoupling. Throw some glyphosate in there to get more of an excitotoxin effect, increasing the metabolic rate more and more uncoupling. You see where this is going? I, I have entire lectures all about that. That's a major cause of neuronal cell death. And you'd say, well, gee, how come no one else figured that out? Why did I figure it out? I'll tell you how I figured it out and other people didn't is because I read about this stuff all the time and I can read in all the different fields. I can read the biochemistry papers, the neurophysiology papers, the neuroanatomy papers, the dementia papers, you name it, the heavy metal toxicity in the brain papers. So that's why I figured it all out. And I read all the nutrition stuff all the time. Um, and then I also figured out that excitotoxicity, excessive stimulation of neurons, brain cells, as well as circa inhibition. Circa means sarcoplasm, endoplasmic reticulum, calcium ATPase. And where that comes from is the endoplasmic reticulum is a, the main storage site of calcium inside the cell. And so normally after a cell is active, it has to pump the cytoplasm calcium both out of the cell, but it also has to pump it into the endoplasmic reticulum. And if you inhibit that pump, then what happens is calcium continues to accumulate in the cytoplasm, which leads to an excitotoxicity effect, okay? And then the next thing is that a mitochondrial inhibitor is a big deal as well because the mitochondria makes all the ATP for the cell. And we just talked about neurovascular uncoupling theory whereby the neuron has to match its energy production to its uh, activity level. And if your mitochondria are inhibited, you can't do it. You can't make enough ATP to reach your metabolic activity demanded level based on all this, the glutamate going across the synapse, so that neuron will die. It'll go into apoptosis. And I basically figured out these things are all the same, okay? And again, why do I figure these things out? Because I kind of have nothing to do. My kids are grown up. My wife works most of the time. I don't talk to her that much anyway, so I just sit around reading all the time. Um, and, you know, why not? I got nothing else to do. And I, I realize I can understand these things better than anyone else in the world. So, I, I, you know, I got, at least I got something to do. Okay, I also figured out the mechanism of spinal degeneration. There had been some papers written in the 1980s showing that uh, heavily atherosclerotic abdominal aorta was associated with increased risk of degenerative disc disease in the lumbar spine. Okay, that's good. And I read that paper, but then I started to realize, well, gee, you know, I, I'm a neuroradiologist. I look at spines all day, every day. You don't just get a little problem in the lumbar spine. You get a problem going all the way from the pelvis, the sacrum, through the entire lumbar spine, thoracic spine, and cervical spine up to the skull, and it's spinal degenerative disc disease, DDD, degenerative disc disease. But guess what? The same patients get DISH, diffuse idiopathic scuttle hyperostosis, meaning bridging osteophytes on the front and the side of the vertebral bodies. The same patients get OPLL, ossification of the posterior longitudinal ligament, and OLF, ossification of the ligamentum flavum. It's all the same thing, okay? And you get a similar appearance with excised fluoride, which I figured out was from the fluoride damaging the protein structure, leading them to become a damps, damage-associated molecular pattern. 
okay, and that causing spinal instability. And then the glyphosate also damages the collagen because it's a glycine phosphate. And every third uh, amino acid in collagen is glycine, so it substitutes in for that. And I learned that from reading Stephanie Sennett's book and papers, okay? Also, a lack of vitamin C can do it because vitamin C is what you need to make collagen. Collagen is about a third of the proteins in the body. And so all of this stuff is the same. And the reason why that's a, a, a big insight is because if you read the old books, like you read the textbooks of spine disease back in the 1990s, they will tell you, OPLL is a very rare condition, more common in Asians, and that's a crock of BS. I see it all day long, every single day, okay? OLF is kind of rare. And also, I see the same thing in the DDD and the DISH patients. Also, I figured out from reading the papers about European um, anthropology, they would dig up these old graveyards when it was time to do construction, and where the rich people were living who had been eating a lot of meat, they had a lot of DISH. And then where the poor people that were, were living, where they were buried, there was almost no dish. So again, that was correlating dish with diabetes. And I've seen it. My same diabetes risk factor patients are the ones that have lots of dish. And then DDD, degenerative disc disease. I figured out, you know, that the disc is alive. It's not dead. It runs on anaerobic glycolysis. And when it's ischemic, the outer steel belted radial tire, so to speak, of the annulus fibrosis cracks. And that leads to the center like a jelly donut, nucleus pulposus leaking out. And the disc dries out. It becomes desiccated. That's what you'll see in MRI reports. And when it becomes desiccated, it no longer can bear so much weight. You get segmental instability. The spine has got lots of proprioceptors because it protects the central nervous system from injury. Therefore, it senses the abnormal motion, and the spine is only one trick, like a hedgehog, but it's the best trick. As Ralph Waldo Emerson had said, it lays down uh, calcifications to form these bridging bone spurs called osteophytes that bridge and fuse with the adjacent vertebral body, so it's an autofusion. It fuses itself like a surgeon can fuse one level, but this causes increased pressure on the adjacent level, so the adjacent level will then go through the same process of rapid disc failure, subsequent formation of osteophytes and its own fusion, and then you get accelerated disc degeneration and osteophyte formation at the adjacent vertebral body. So this continues all the way from the pelvis up to the skull, and this person ends up with an autofuse spine. Their spine's painful, stiff, and they stop exercising, all their muscles atrophy, now they're weak, and they fall over, and they fracture their spine and become paraplegics, okay? I see this all the time. So anyways, um, this is the history of what, who did what in nutrition. Uh, I hope it was helpful.